العالمين وصلاة وسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله على عليه وأصحابه وأزواجه وزرياته وأهل بيته بارك سلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا حما بادو My brothers, my dear brothers and sisters, I uh, my apologies again for uh, the fact that we are starting a bit late. Uh, I think we this time we relied too much on technology because we got, this is being done uh, literally from three continents. The people involved are, are in three different places. But alhamdulillah, uh, it seems that eventually it did uh, work. The topic is preparing children for a future that we know nothing about. Uh, this is something that children's education, especially primary school education, uh, is uh, something that I am very passionate about because uh, this is literally our future. You know, without uh, mincing any words, this is our future. We say this very uh blazely about uh, children this is our future future generation next gen and whatnot but i don't know how many people really uh, think about it seriously in that way and i think it's very important to do that just yesterday it so happened that in my juma the i asked four questions the first question i asked was do you have a dream for your child do you have a dream for your child i'm asking you this question uh, do you have a dream for your child Number two question, and if you if you have grown up children, then my question is, did you have a dream for your child? And if you did not have a dream, at least do yourself a favor and do your children a favor. Sit them down and ask them if they have a dream for their children, which is your grandchildren. So do you have a dream for your child? Number one. Second question I asked was, is that written down? Meaning, is it, are you serious about that dream or was it just a passing thought? So is that dream written down somewhere? Number third question was, did you share that dream with your child? Because at the end of the day, the child and you must be in sync with that dream. Otherwise, you don't want the child to say, oh, that's a nice dream. Keep it. I don't know. I'm not interested. So did you tell your child? Did you share that dream with your child? And number four was, what did your child say? Now, my question to you, all of you here, is do we, do, does anybody actually have this kind of serious conversation with your children? And if you are not doing that, let me tell you that you are doing yourself and them a huge, huge, huge disfavor. Because this is a serious conversation that you must sit your child down and have with them. This is your commitment as a parent. Believe me, parenting is a lot more than paying bills. Now, this is something that we have to somehow get into uh, our thought, thought process and get into our hearts and minds and commit the time and energy and the effort that it takes. It's amazing, this doesn't take money, right? Money is, the, is not even a consideration in this. What it takes is time and effort and energy, and if we are not going to spend that for our own children, then I want to ask you, what else are you spending it on? So if your children are important to you, you decide, it's your children. If your children are important to you, please sit them down and have this conversation. It's extremely, extremely important. I want to say to you that uh, animals are born, humans are made. The reason I say that is because the whole point of civilization, to be civilized, is to do things that do not come naturally. Or to put it in another way, to not do things which come naturally because that is the more civilized way of behaving. Take anger, for example. I can give you many examples, but let me just give you one. Take anger, for example. Anger is a natural emotion. Anger may be highly justified in a particular case. There may be something and somewhere where you really want to vent and you want to use all kinds of choice language and so on and so forth. But what do you train yourself to do? You train yourself not to do any of those things which come naturally because that is not the civilized thing to do, right? So this is the making, the shaping, the molding of a human being. And that's why I say animals are born. Everyone, a, a human child is an animal. It's a mammal. It's a baby mammal. But when does he or she 
convert into a human being. And that's why somebody said, everybody has two birthdays. The day they were born and the day they realize why. And the tragedy is that many people, the second birthday never comes. Our society today, I want you to want to do a very quick uh, thumbnail sketch. Our society today is characterized by anxiety, by fear, by distrust, insecurity in the midst of wealth. Right? I was just scrolling through the um, list of uh, people attending this and uh, I, I see several of my dear friends and elders who are also doctors and who are working. Many of them have uh, uh, major cases that they get are of mental illness different forms of mental, mental illness. And believe me, all of that is not related to COVID. This stuff is there within us. It is, it is something that we have been suffering from. COVID only uh, threw it up for some people. So we are a society which is characterized by anxiety, by fear, by distrust. We don't trust anybody. We have, can you imagine, this is a society, and I have lived long enough to, to know a society where this didn't happen. This is a society where fake news, falsehood, lies, uh, rumor mongering is an actual multi-billion dollar industry. What does that mean? It means there are thousands upon thousands of people who go to work every day, who spend the whole day in creating lies and falsehood, knowing full well that this actually hurts people. Based on those lies, there are people being killed, there are people being being uh, maligned and people being uh, mistreated and so on and so abused because of these lies. They spend their whole day doing that. They take a salary for that. They eat from that money and they feed their children that money. This is our culture. And we come from a, from a, from a background where our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not tell a lie even as a joke. And we are living in a society where lying and cheating is a career. There is, and all of this in the midst of wealth, in the midst of well being. Second one, our virtues in this society. What are the standards that we live by? Our virtues are a dog eat dog mentality, competition for the sake of competition, growth for the sake of growth. In the words of one of my, my dear friends, Professor Madhukar Shukla uh, of XLRI, uh, he says, growth for the sake of growth is the philosophy of the cancer cell. Growth for the sake of growth is the philosophy of the cancer cell. Ask yourself what happens to the cancer itself. Forget about the, the host, the human being who suffers from that cancer. What happens to the cancer itself when that human being dies? That cancer also dies. That is our society. So hypocrisy is now a art, an art form. Our blind spots, what we refuse to see, one is mutual responsibility. We refuse to see and accept the fact that we, as human beings, as individuals, are responsible for what happens in our society. Whether we like it or not, we are directly or indirectly responsible for what happens in our society. Second one is blind spot is compassion. And one of the big reasons for that is television and social media. All the horrible, horrific videos that we forward everywhere, believe me, not only do they not have any good effect, not only does nothing change on the ground because of those videos, but actually it kills your heart. Because you watch all this blood and gore and misery and tears and screaming and whatnot over and over again, and you get deadened to that. It, it no longer makes any difference to you. There's a famous saying of Imam al Ghazali. Imam al Ghazali said, When you invite people for a meal, do not talk about death. You know, because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the one, the most intelligent one, is the one who remembers his death most often before standing before Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Now, he's not contradicting the hadith. He, he's, he's explaining the, the time and place for something. So in Imam al-Ghazali said that when you invite somebody to a meal, do not talk about death. Because he said one of two things will happen. If the person's heart is alive, then the person will not be able to eat. 
Because now he's thinking about himself standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's thinking about himself in the cover. What is what's going to happen to him? How will he eat? So his appetite is gone. You invited him for a meal and you ruined his appetite. So there is no sense in talking about death at that time. He said the other possibility is that nothing happens to him. He's able to eat very well, which means that his heart is dead. And that is not something you want to discover at that time. So compassion is something that seems to have completely vanished. We have got completely deadened to the misery and the suffering of other human beings. Whereas Rasulullah said that this whole ummah, and by the ummah is meant the Muslims, as well as all, all of humanity. He said this is like one body. If the head pains, the whole body knows it. Now today the head can pain, nothing, nothing. the whole body is perfectly uh, okay with the head pain. And finally, very importantly, our blind spot is accountability. Somewhere we have, we seem to have, uh, uh, we seem to have internalized this, this gross and completely, uh, you know, huge falsehood that nothing will happen. I can say what I want, I can do what I want, I can, I can act in any way I want, but nothing will happen. Now there's nothing which is a bigger lie than this. But we seem to have internalized this. Muslims and others. That is our society. We as a society are very, very sick. In the words of uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, he said it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a sick society. Now, why am I talking about this? Because schools is where this begins. Schooling is where it begins. And therefore, schooling is where this can be ended. And we'll see as we go forward how. Snapshot of today. Three major issues. We have a surfeit of information. We have got enormous amount of information. But we do not have the tools to deal with it positively. Nobody teaches strategic thinking. Nobody teaches uh, us how to how to dissent, to disagree without being disagreeable. Nobody teaches us to focus based on our life goals so that we are, we can decide and we can differentiate between good information and useless information. There has to be some basis. This is not taught to us anyway. So we have a huge amount of information, television, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, books, of course, nobody reads, uh, social media, hmm? WhatsApp University. But we don't have the tools to deal with that information. So all that the information does, it makes us more confused, it makes us angry, it makes us depressed, it makes us even more fearful, it makes us distrusting of everyone and everything. The whole global argument today going on with regard to COVID vaccines is an excellent example to illustrate this. Right? There are people who believe in the vaccines and in science. There are people who believe in snake oil and all kinds of joshindas and whatnot. And there are people who believe that, you know, imagine, I mean, all kinds of stuff is going on. And there are people who seriously believe these things. And most of us, we don't know what to believe which is a great way to illustrate that we do not have the tools to deal with the flood of information that comes to us. Number two, we have a surfeit of technology, all kinds of technology. But how to use that technology? What is the, what is the tool, the criterion? What is the bit in the mouth of the horse and what are the reins? We have no bit in the mouth of our horse and we have no reins. We have a horse which is running wild. To give you another example, somebody sent me a Cadbury ad. You can look it up. Cadbury ad with uh, Shah Rukh Khan, who's, the, who's doing the ad. Now, it's a very nice ad in the sense that it is Shah Rukh Khan promoting uh, neighborhood businesses. So he's saying that because of this COVID and so on and so forth, uh, you know, people have uh, suffered. So, and this is because it is Diwali time in India. So they say, well, uh, in Diwali, buy your sweets and buy your whatever jewelry or whatever you want. Buy them from local people. 
local shops, your neighborhood guy, whatever, you know, down the street, uh, and so on and so forth. But interesting thing was that this video, the way, the way it is made, um, they have used artificial intelligence to, to take Shah Rukh Khan's face and have him and recreate that face and have that face saying the actual names of the shops that he's promoting. So, and, and they, linking this to Facebook and so on and so forth, they gave this into the hands of people to say that you can nominate your shops and so on, and you will have Shah Rukh Khan saying, uh, buy from this shop, right? Buy from this shop. The fact of the matter is that that face is something which has been created artificially. That is not Shah Rukh Khan saying that. But the video you are seeing is Shah Khan saying it. All right. So this is a nice video. And Cadbury is doing a great job. Fantastic. My point is that technology is also useful and available for somebody who wants to use it for a nefarious purpose, for an evil purpose. That technology can put your face on my face and we could be saying all kinds of things which we never said, which we never know about. But the people watching the video will say, no, 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 I have got evidence. Here is this video of so-and-so saying these things. Now, who will stop that from happening? It's not the technology. It is the individual. And for the individuals, therefore, individuals must be therefore trained before anything else in ethics and morals and values. Because ask yourself, what drives our decision making? And I, that brings me to my third point, which is we have a surfeit of wealth. We have enormous, enormous wealth, but we have a complete lack of compassion. Today, as I speak, there is no material reason why even a single human being should go to bed hungry. There is no material reason why even a single child should be denied basic education. There is no material reason why a single sick, sick person should be denied basic medical care. There is enough, we have enough wealth as I speak in this world, in the pockets and bank accounts of individuals to ensure that this does not happen. It need not happen. Yet, is that wealth being used for that? Or is it being used for something else? That's the question. So it's how we use technology that matters. It's not the technology itself. Technology is value neutral. What must be understood is what drives our decision making. Our Hyderabad me kahavat hai. Sone ki churi rahe to bhog lete kya bolte hain hum? Meaning that if the if the knife is made of gold, will you stab yourself? So just because the technology is good, meaning powerful, meaning wide ranging, it does not automatically mean that that technology will be used for good purposes. It is the individual, the human beings concerned, who will decide whether how the technology is used. And therefore, we have to mold the human beings with the right set of values and ethics and morals to ensure that this technology is used for good and not for evil. Future generations, really, if you, if you, if you think about this, future generations, I sometimes think to myself, you know, in, say in the year 20, 2300, so roughly 300 years from now, uh, if there is an archaeological dig or something, uh, they, they find our civilization. They will seriously, people will wonder how we knew so much and we had so much. Not only could, despite that, uh, even though we had so much and we knew so much, not only could we not prevent our own destruction, but we actually accelerated it. Talk about global warming, talk about, about uh, carbon, uh, you know, uh, carbon uh, content of things, talk about uh, fossil fuels. We spent billions and billions of dollars on fossil fuel subsidies, which really should have been spent in education, in public health and so on and so forth. Seriously, we do not have the excuse of ignorance and poverty. But we can say that we were stupid, if that's an excuse. Think about this. Who do we pay more? Teachers 
or entertainers. How do we how do you define success? Morally or materially? Yesterday I did a seminar in our masjid here. Every alternate Friday I do a seminar. I'm teaching a, a, a whole series of seminars called Seven Keys to Success. And yesterday's seminar, I asked a question. I asked them, name for me three global leaders. Three global leaders, all Muslims who were sitting in the, in the seminar, right? So I asked them, name for me three global leaders. Who do they name? Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. This is our focus. Only material wealth. Nothing else. Not even moral. Third one. What do we focus more on? Knowing or doing? We have people attending, even Islamically speaking, we have people attending, enrolling for this course and that course and that course and that course. Then you ask them, okay, you learned all of this stuff. Where is it applied in your life? I'm not saying they don't apply it, but obviously, if you're going to learn so many things, to apply all of them is almost impossible. Same story with everything else. We know a hell of a lot. Very little application. And the fourth one is, who do we spend more on? Ourselves or others? Short term or long term? The reason I'm asking you this question, the reason I want you to ask yourself this question is, you get what you pay for. Somebody told me a nice story. They said that, uh, this guy says that my grandfather came uh, to the US and uh, in those days they would come by ship from Europe and they would land at Ellis Island, which is in uh, New York, uh, you know, where, where the Statue of Liberty is. So he said the, he got processed and so on and so forth. He got his US passport and he went and sat in the cafeteria. And he said he's sitting there, he's very hungry. He wants to eat, but he's sitting there uh, and nothing happens. He says, after a long time, another man with a tray full of food came and sat opposite him. And he greeted him and he said, what's up? The man said, you know, I'm so hungry. The man said, look, that thing over there is the buffet. Now you go to that end of the buffet, pick up a tray, then go along the buffet, put on that tray, anything you want, and you come to the cashier and you pay. He said, this is America. You get what you pay for. You can have anything you can pay for. Now believe me, this is not only about America, this is about life. You get what you pay for. And if we are going to pay teachers less than entertainers, then we have no right to complain about what is happening to society and societal morals and ethics and values. Ask yourself one question. We spend more by multiples, not just more in terms of uh, you know, absolute, num ab uh, absolute number, but in multiples. We spend more on arms and ammunition, weapons of mass destruction than on medical research. Even today with COVID, if you take the numbers, the amount of money that's being spent on research to end COVID is not even a fraction of the amount of money being spent on weapons of mass destruction. How to kill the maximum number of people in the shortest possible time. Number two, we know that porn corrupts, but we don't stop it. We talk about freedom of expression. Number three, we know that cigarettes kill. And even more than that, gutka and all of the, all of the you know, tobacco stuff. But we don't ban it. Because they pay taxes. We know that alcohol is a drug. And it's a drug which is the worst of all drugs because there is no cure for alcoholics. Alcoholics Anonymous themselves say that an alcoholic, once you have become an alcoholic, once your body has got used to that, it cannot be cured. They say the only thing you can do is stay away from it. But even if you have stayed away from it for 20 years, if you, take, if you get one drink, 
One shot of whiskey will put you back in the same place. Alcohol actually destroys brain cells. Yet, we do not ban alcohol. And then we are very surprised at the society. And some people even have the temerity to say, why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God do something? What do you want God to do? God will do something when you meet him on the day of judgment. Here God did something, which is he created you. Ask yourself, why don't I do something? What should I do? And all this is happening, why? Because we have only a one point single minded focus and that is making money. As long as we make money, we don't care how we make this money. The same story for individuals, the same story for governments. Otherwise, ask yourself, how is it that we have Muslim countries? We have countries who talk about being the standard bearers of Islam and they allow and promote interest-based banking in those countries. How does it work? Hypocrisy and nifak is the biggest curse, the biggest disease. And that is what we have to get out of. Ask how. How can we get contentment when our progress is based on discontent? Competition. What's competition? Discontent. Keeping up with the Joneses. What is the car that one has? What is the car this one has? How can we have contentment? How can we get peace when our progress is based on greed? Not need. Greed. Third one is, can we get contribution when our progress is based on consumption? Just buy, 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 whether you like it or not. Shopping, shopping, shopping. In America, go to anybody's house. Right? It's a, uh, I'm making a blanket statement, but, and those who are, to whom this statement doesn't apply, all power to you. But most people, the majority of them, go into their, go into the, go to their house, go into their garage. And if you, with that person who owns the house and the garage, if you go with him through whatever is in the garage, you will find that person will be surprised to discover some of the things in his own garage. And that's not because somebody else put them there. It's because they themselves, they bought the stuff, they put it there, never used it. It's lying there. They don't even know they have it. Because when you have dissatisfaction as the motivator, depression is the result. And that's what we are suffering from as a society. And that's why I say, invest in assets, not toys. Assets add value, not cost. Now, what must education do? Education must transform an animal into a human being. And that's why I mentioned this earlier, which is that to civilize is to enable you to do that which does not come naturally. Anyone who does something naturally is often reverting to the original animal state. So therefore, education must differentiate. But does it? Does our education differentiate? Why differentiate? Because differentiation creates brand. Brand inspires loyalty. Loyalty enables influence. Without brand, you are a grain of rice in a sack. So my question to you is, what is your brand? What will you be remembered for? Ask yourself this question. And that's why I say, those who stand out are honored. Those who blend in are sheep. Those who stand out are honored. And those who blend in are sheep. So what must we do? Three priorities. 
first and foremost understand what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, jalla jalaluhu uh, mentioned about integration of religion and education religion and science allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu in surah al-imran in the ayat 190 and 191 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا ضب النار الله جل جلاله said which means verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the night and the day there are indeed signs for people of understanding. Who are those? Allah described them. They are those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing, sitting and lying down. And think and, and the key word is and, and think deeply about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Saying, O oh, our Rabb, you have not created all of this without purpose. You did not create this in vain. Glory be to you. Give us salvation from the fire, from the torment of the fire. The key word, my brothers and sisters, is and. What? Wow. Because if you take this as a sentence in the Arabic language, Allah's description of al ulil al people of understanding, people of intelligence, people of knowledge, if you take this as a sentence in the Arabic language and substitute au for wow, substitute or for and, then what will you say? Alladhina yazkuruna allaha qiyamu wa quudu wa ala junubihim au yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samabati wal ard. Who are the ulil al-bab? Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing, sitting and lying down or those who do research in the creation of the heavens and the earth. What is thinking deeply? It is research. What is that? It is every single thing that comes or can come till the day of judgment in the name of research, in the name of science, in the name of discovery. Everything. So if the sentence is said like the way I said it, Grammatically speaking, in the Arabic language, this sentence is correct. But it is not the ayat of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us two things in this ayat, two very, very important things. Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us the relationship between theology, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not talking about information about Allah, I'm talking about knowledge about Allah, your internalized knowledge. You know Allah, you don't know about Allah, you know Allah. After knowing about Allah, you know Allah. Jalla Jalla. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us the relationship between this and his creation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that the intelligent people, people of understanding are those who know both, who focus on both, who study both, who know the relationship between the two. They do not deny one for the other. Dhikr wa fikr. Not dhikr au fikr. No. Dhikr and fikr. Not dhikr or fikr. Number one. Number two. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the sequence of these two. For example, again, going back to the, to the language example I gave you. If I were to write a sentence, or meaning that those who do the fikr fi samawati first were and zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I reverse this sequence, once again, this would be grammatically correct, but it is not the ayat of the Quran. 
In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us what to do and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us the sequence of that, which comes before which. Now there is huge, huge, huge hikmat in this. There is huge wisdom in this. And the wisdom is that if you want to see the reality of something, you have to use the right kind of glasses. If I want to see something which is very small and I use a telescope for that, can I see? If I use a pair of binoculars for that, can I look at it? Something very small, an amoeba, a virus, a bacteria. I might say I have the best telescope in the world. You cannot see it. Because that's not the right lens to see the reality of that thing. You need a microscope. You might need an electron microscope, depending on how small that thing is. Similarly, if I want to look at celestial objects, and I have this fab fabulous microscope, and I take my micro microscope, turn it upside down, and I look at the, turn it upwards, and I look at, you know, the, 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 or try to look at the stars. And I say, no, no, something is wrong. My microscope is fantastic. Yes, something is wrong. Here, in your head, not the microscope. Because you're using the wrong lens to see that thing. If you want to see the reality of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jalla jalla lahu, you have to look at it through the lens of taqwa. Through the lens of khashiyatullah. Through the lens of ta'alluq ma'allah. Without that, the reality, the actual fact of the creation will not be visible to you, no matter how much you think you know it. This is what Allah is saying. First get the lens. First get the right lens. Then look. If you look at it without the lens or with something else, a wrong lens, you're not going to see it. This is the fundamental basis of education, of Islamic education. Today we have at best dhikr, dhikrullah bolted on to a schooling system, to a teaching system. It's not intrinsic to it. It's not developed through it. We have it bolted on. That doesn't work. That does not work. We have centuries of experience to show it does not work. And you know what it, what it proves? It proves that history has lessons, but we never learn. History shows that we don't learn from history. Seriously, I think the time is, is long past, but we should break out of this horrible way of what we like to call education. So the fundamental thing first and foremost is to teach values because values cannot be legislated. You cannot drive values into your child with a hammer. They must be inculcated because children listen with their eyes. They don't care what you say until they see what you do. Right? They don't care what you say until they see what you do. Now, so what must we do? We must focus our education on three things. Number one, knowledge. Tools to acquire and understand and process information. Let me remind you that the way the world has changed, today we have reached a stage where if we only take data, if we only take experience, what happened to me, then if I say to my son or my grandson, or my daughter or my granddaughter, if I say to them, in my day, this is how things used to be, if they are polite, they won't reply to me, but if they're not polite, they might even ask me, so what? Because your day was different. Yes, you used to walk five miles and swim across, swim across a river to go to school. And I have to just click on my computer and my school is here in front of me. 
on my screen. So what is the relationship? What are you trying to teach me? I am not saying that your and my life is now to be trashed. I am saying that we have to now go a step ahead and extract teachable lessons which, are, which make sense in their modern context today. Just talking about in my day is completely worth. At best, if you are a great storyteller, which most people are not, at best, it's a nice story. At worst, it's a waste of time. So, focus, we can teach them tools. We can teach them how to deal with the information that they have. We can teach them how to deal with their world and what's, what they are experiencing. So, we need to teach them tools to acquire and understand and process information. Number two is we need to teach them skills. Give them a skill to be able to, a marketable skill to be able to produce a product or a service which is saleable. Entrepreneurship is the way to go forward. The world going forward is going to be, and right now it is a, a world of entrepreneurship. And that world is something that will not come from the kind of education model that we have, which is looking backwards, past oriented. People like to talk about Elon Musk. What is he doing? Number one, he has changed and he's in the process of changing the entire concept of transportation. Number two, he's sending rockets to different planets. Number three, which many, many people don't know, and to me that is the, the most important part, is he is behind a school called the Synthesis School, which is doing all the kind of stuff that I'm talking about which is dealing with children, giving them complex problems, letting them solve those complex problems, giving them simulations and games which are focused on complexity and how to deal with complexity because that is the key skill, this ability to deal with complexity. That's what they do in that school. They do not have standard classrooms like we have and so on and so forth in, in our standard schools. They don't teach the same standard subjects. They teach in what I have been talking about as the integrated teaching model of teaching through projects. What they don't have there is the plugin or the basic fundamental uh, platform of Ta'aluk Ma'Allah. So, skills. Number three, personal development, people skills. At the end of the day, believe me, no matter how uh, technologically knowledgeable you might be, in life you succeed more for your people skills than for anything else. The ability to get along with people, the ability to inspire people, the ability to lead people, the ability to resolve conflicts, the ability to collaborate, the ability, your manners. This is what gets you ahead in life. Technology is not unimportant. Knowledge and, and, and content in knowledge is not unimportant. It is important. But it is these things which will take you far and long. So ethics, morals, manners, relationships, all of this. And then, of course, Literacy, numeracy, and money. About to how to deal with money, what money is, and then of course all of that from our Islamic perspective as well. Now, what is integrated teaching? Integrated teaching is to facilitate self-learning by teaching through projects. There are, I think, two or three videos of mine where I've explained this in detail, so I won't go into that here. By all means, watch that. Uh, watch those videos. They're called integrated teaching. Just in Google type or in YouTube type integrated teaching and my name, you'll get them. So facilitate self-learning 
by teaching through projects. The same thing, the same knowledge, we can teach them in multiple ways through, uh, through projects. Again, let, me give you, let me give you a little example of this. For example, um, we have, let me ask you this question. When I say integrate, I mean, of course, integrating theology with uh, science and other subjects. But even in the other subjects, ask yourself, how is it that we teach chemistry as a discrete, uh, isolated topic? And then we teach physics as a discrete, isolated topic. And then we teach history as a discrete, isolated topic. And we teach geography as a discrete, isolated topic. Why? Whereas in reality, they are all related. I'll give you an example. Ask yourself why we don't teach the chemistry of water, H2O, and in terms of the sea, how does the salt get in, why is the sea blue, and so on and so forth, right? So why don't we teach um, the chemistry of water along with them, along with it, with we teach also Archimedes principle, which is the reason a ship weighing thousands of tons floats on water. And then lead from there into, for example, the story of the British Empire, which was based on their ability to sail the oceans using navigation equipment, astrolabs and star maps, which Europe got from the Muslims. If it was not for the Arabs, especially in Andalusia, there would have been no European Renaissance. It's not accidental that 60% of the names of stars are of Arabic origin. Then ask why the Arabs and before them the Polynesians and even before them the Greeks and Romans all had ships, but it was the British, the Portuguese and the Spanish who were able to sail across the major ocean and reach the Americas, of course, accidentally, and China and India and Japan. These people came much later, but they did this. Now, interestingly, the reason for that lies in botany more than anything else. It was because these people, the Europeans, had access to coniferous trees in the Northern Hemisphere, which the Arabs and the Polynesians and others didn't have. That's the reason they were able to build ships that could cross the great oceans. It was tall ships that took them across the oceans to colonize, plunder, decimate, enslave populations and enrich their own countries. Pope Nicholas V in the 15th century issued a papal edict called the Doctrine of Discovery, which authorized European Christian nations, and I quote, to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans and other enemies of Christ, to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to take away all their possessions and property. The ships were the vehicles for the spread of this ideology of military domination of the world. Thanks to botany, history was written. In the Americas, it was the eastern white pine tree, which is in these areas where I, where I, where I live now, which is the northeast of, of England. Um, this was what the English and the English found this because the English used to have to compete for coniferous trees in the Balkans with the Spanish and Portuguese. But when the English crossed the Atlantic and uh, the King of England uh, symbolically took uh, possession of the Americas, uh, they found the English, they found the eastern white pine tree. And this is what they needed to build their clipper ships and their galleons. Straight, strong, light mass, masts that thanks to the slow growth of the trees were very dense and resistant to, resistant to decay. I quote, the majestic eastern white pine is the tallest of the pine species in North America, basically the sequoia of the Northeast. Trees 150 to 240, 150 
to 240 feet tall and trunks free of branches to heights of 80 feet or more were plentiful when the new world, so-called, was being colonized by the British, by the English and other Europeans. Now, the King of England, uh, using what is called the doctrine of uh, dominion, took possession of all eastern white pine trees and appointed a legion of surveyors of pines and timber to survey and mark all suitable trees with what's called the king's broad arrow, a series of three hatchet slashes on the trunk of the tree. Violation by the colonists of this rule was fined, they would be fined 100 British pounds. And we are talking about the 1700s. So that's like a million dollars today, a lot of this, right? Not a million dollars, but it's a huge amount of money. 100 pounds in the 1700s for anyone who cut a eastern pine tree, which symbolically belonged to the King of England. Only the Royal Navy had the, uh, had the power to use those trees. That's why the eastern white pine played an equally key role in events that led to the Revolutionary War and American independence from English rule. Now, do you see how we can teach botany, history, chemistry, physics, and the principle of principles of leadership, all the while telling a very interesting true story. Now, this must be taught with constant reference to the one who created the trees and the oceans and the which people used one to sail on the other, who created the stars to show the way, who created people and to, to, who gave us a, a, a set of uh, standards of how to be with each other, which we violate. All of this needs to be shared and that is what uh, integrated teaching is all about. Now, why should we change? Right? I'm coming to a close. Why should we change? Because there are two kinds of people. There are influencers and consumers. They have very different trajectories and endings. Now, what you must do as a teacher or parent to move yourself and your children and students to become influencers, move them from being consumers to being influencers. Now, ask yourself, what is the cost of not changing? A big question for those who aspire to lead in this world. How does our education prepare them to do that? How does our education today prepare our children to lead in this world? That is, I won't even say it's ahead. We are in it now. So ask yourself as teachers and parents, what must change in our attitudes and methods and focus? Focus on with respect to technology and education. And what does that mean in terms of investment and in terms of pain? Because we will have to take a lot of pain. We have to make a lot of effort. We have to be ready for the long haul. There's no instant coffee. It will happen, but it will happen in time. If you don't agree with this, ask yourself what is the alternative? Believe me. There are leaders and there are slaves. Both are essential. It's your choice where you want to be and where you want to place your children. As simple as that. I want to end finally with my quote where I say people remember us not by what we consumed but by what we contributed. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah accept your coming. May Allah accept this uh, uh, seminar and uh, make this a means of goodness and khair and barakah for all of you wa sallallahu ala nabiyil karim wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahim wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakallah sheikh for a beautiful talk uh, indeed um, you pointed out i have a question here from uh, shiba malik salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh please suggest some good books which i can make my 8 year old child read to inculcate a strong, a sense of strong iman. Um, my submission to you, my sister, is strong iman will come to your child 
based on what you do, based on your actions, based on the atmosphere in your home. It won't come from reading books. So as far as your eight-year-old child is concerned, by all means, read books, teach, them, teach, teach the child the first and most important book to learn to read is the Quran. Uh, so do all that, but focus on what the atmosphere in your home is like. Focus on how your child is experiencing you and your child's father, how the child is experiencing the parents, and what the child is learning in terms of Iman and Yaqeen and Tawakul and so on from the parents. <clears throat> uh, Wasim Ahmad, best book on teenage parenting, any name? Uh, well, I have my book, which is uh, Raising a Muslim Child, so you can read that, inshallah. And uh, other books, I don't, I don't remember. Um, you know, my, this is uh, something that I... It's a good, good question. The point is that I... Uh, oh, I should answer like, okay. Um, I said the be best book, Wasim Ahmad said, the best book on teenage parenting, is there any name? I said my own book is there, which is called Raising a Muslim Child. So do read, do read that. Uh, the Again, at risk of repetition, um, the question I... Uh, the thing that I want to, uh, in, to, to emphasize is that once again, it depends on the model that the parents present, the model that the teachers present uh, to the children, which is a very good, uh, which is the only model which really works. Uh, students are inspired by teachers. Children are inspired by parents, provided uh, those, those parents and teachers are, are inspiring. <clears throat> so we need to ask this question, say, how inspiring am I? to uh, my child. Um, anonymous attendee, is it a good decision to pause the school study of an eight-year-old and start HIPS full-time then after continuous study either with British Board or regular? No, I think it's a very bad decision. Uh, HIPS of Quran should be continued along with the regular study without putting pressure on the child. Please understand there is no earthly reason or heavenly reason why a child must memorize the Quran in two years or three years. Let him take 10 years. It doesn't matter. As long as they are continuously engaged with the Quran and as long as they are memorizing as they go along, keep that going in the background and let them continue their studies. Taking them out of school uh, for two years for hips, I think is a very bad idea because it puts a lot of pressure. And think about this. Remember this. Anything that comes to somebody in an unpleasant way only increases their resistance to it, right? And anybody who's going to tell me that a child actually enjoys uh, doing hips, then I must say you have an incredibly, uh, incredibly you know, unusual child. Because sitting and uh, memorizing and repeating something over and over again, even the Kalam of Allah is very difficult. And so therefore, don't put pressure on that. Alhamdulillah, in due course, it will happen and uh, continue with their studies. So that one is done. This one is done. Then, uh, Samir Ahmed, can we have a copy of this webinar? Well, that is something that the uh, organizers will answer for you. Um, Aisha Khan, Salaam Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Uh, what goals should parents discuss and set for themselves as soon as the child is born? Well, that's something for the parents to think about. Um, I, I, I will not uh, presume to dictate goals for anybody, but uh, you and your husband, Mahir, uh, uh, and you sit and ask yourself this question and say, what goals, what do we want uh, our child to be like? What kind of person do we want the child to be like? And be, be you know, uh, don't make the goal and then pressurize the child and, and drive them nuts. No. The point is that have a goal which is a, which is a high goal, which is a beautiful goal and then focus on that goal. 
Uh, that is very important. And as I said, I, I, I will not put myself in the position of dictating to you. That's something that you must sit and do for yourself. But do that. Consciously do that. Uh, Wasim Ahmad, I think I answered this, uh, this thing. A good book on teenage parenting. Well, as I said, I, I know my book. Uh, it's called Raising a Muslim Child. And uh, whether the other books, I don't know. I'm sure there are plenty of books. The question is that uh, more than the books, it is your own personal example which uh, which does the difference. Um, then we have um, Fatima Khatun. Any books on how to approach integrated teaching, and any books that has integrated teaching, so that we can set example. Uh, again, as I as I said, I the, I don't think there are any books. I I have not seen any books. I'm sure there may be. I mean, let me not say there are none. Uh, maybe there are uh, some books, but I am not aware of that. Uh, but I have uh, uh, my own uh, videos on that. So go to YouTube and type integrated teaching and type my name, Mirza Yavar Beg, and you will get the link. Uh, my son is attending, is entering his teenage. Can you kindly suggest a proper guideline for him to follow? As I told you again and again, um, it depends on you. I mean, guideline to follow is the parents are the examples. The parents must set the guideline. What is that guideline? Of course, the fundamental of it is the faraiz of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ensure that, ensure that you are praying uh, your salah on time uh, in the masjid. Take your, take your son with you. Take your, take your daughter with you. And uh, then ensure that there is a daily reading of Quran. There is a focus on the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in addition to that, uh, focus on the studies. Have a conversation with them. Help them to understand what is your vision for them. Is that inspiring for them or not? Have a conversation with them. Understand that a teenage child is an adult. Is really an adult, right? In disguise. So don't treat them like little small children. Treat them like adults as equals. And you will find you will have, inshallah, good results with them. Okay. I think uh, we are done. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. You are, of course, most uh, welcome to be in touch with me. And uh, may Allah bless you and keep you in his protection always. Wa sallallahu ala nabil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain bi rahmatika alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.